Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inzor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about um, certain things related to splitting nuclei of certain elements, which uh, is called fission. Um, now, the previous lectures were basically kind of preparation to this one. We were talking about mass defect. Um, so that's a very important part and I will definitely talk about this today. Um, now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented on Unisor.com. Uh, I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website uh, because you might actually find it somewhere else on YouTube, Google, whatever. But the website actually has a lot of advantages. Well, number one, it's completely free. There are no advertisement, no strings attached. You don't even have to sign in. So everything is completely at your uh, disposal. Um, secondly, every lecture has textual description, basically, which is like a textbook. So you can listen to, you can watch the lecture, your video presentation, and you can read about the same thing as in the textbook. Um, then certain parts of the course have problems to solve, organized as exams, and you can take these exams as, as many times as you want. Um, uh, well, and then there is a prerequisite course called Math for Teens on the same website. Um, mathematics is extremely important, and uh, whatever I'm using uh, in this course of physics, uh, whatever mathematics I'm using in the course of physics, it's all there. Uh, so, I mean, if you know it, that's great. If you don't, you can take the course called Math for Teams on the same website. Okay, back to fission. So, it was noticed that certain um, elements are radioactive, which means they emit certain alpha, beta, or gamma rays, which we were talking about in the previous lectures. Um, and certain elements are actually so unstable that um, if affected in some way, they might actually split into two other elements. And that's what we're talking about, mass defect. But in this case, it's more significant because we're talking about uh, a, a forceful splitting of certain nuclei. Now, in particular, um, the special isotope of uranium, uranium-235, which means it has 92 protons, and uh, whatever it's 143 neutrons. So the atomic number is 235, that's total number of um, uh, particles in uh, in the nucleus, protons plus ne neutrons, and this is the protons, this is the positive, basically, charge which has the nucleus. So, this particular isotope of uranium, which is rare, um, much more frequently occurring is uranium-238, with more neutrons, the same 92 protons, but more neutrons. So, this particular isotope of uranium, if it's bombarded with neutrons, well, bombarded may be not exactly the good word, if it absorbs a neutron. Now, neutron has atomic number one because it's one particle and no zero uh, charge, electric charge. So, what happens in this particular case, the nuclei, nu nucleus of this particular element, if it consumes one neutron, uh, becomes unstable. Now, I mean, you can actually, at the moment of absorption, you can say it's uranium-236, because it adds one to, to the atomic number. But it's unstable. Uranium-238 is stable, uranium-236 is not. Why? It's a different story and I don't know really, quite frankly. 
but anyway it it's unstable and it splits into two halves well not exactly equal halves and not exactly always the same way but it splits somehow so one of the possible splitting is as follows it produces barium which has 139 atomic number and 56 protons plus krypton what is it 95 36 plus two neutrons free now let's just count the number of particles 230 5 plus 1, that's 236. 139 plus 95, it's uh, 244, uh, 234 uh, plus 2, 236. 236, okay. So number of particles is okay. Now the electric charge, 92 plus 0 is 92. 56 plus 36 is also 92. So we have balance. I mean, nothing disappeared, actually. Electric charge is the same, which means number of protons, basically. And number of total, total number of particles is also the same, so number of neutrons is the same. Everything is great. Now, okay, fine. Now let's talk about mass. Now, when you take the mass of these particles and I have it written it's 235.043928 plus uh, 100 plus neutron these are masses now if you take these you have 139 point something I have exact numbers uh, 94 um, something and 2 something and the result would be 235.863 the result of here is 236.051 so I have exact numbers in the text part of this lecture on the website doesn't matter what matter is there is no equality in mass that's the most important part of the fission process. It's fine, number of particles is the same, number of positive uh, particles, protons is the same, but the mass is not the same. So we have a difference in, <coughs> in this case, 188. Now, when I'm talking about these numbers, what are these masses? These are atomic um, uh, mass units or deltons sometimes. That's the name of the physicist. Atomic mass unit is basically approximate um, mass of um, one proton or one neutron, kind of an average between them. So what they have decided the mass of carbon it's 12 particles divided by 12. So this is atomic mass unit. I did talk about this before, but anyway, that's how we measure masses. And obviously it has its equivalent in kilograms, obviously, in the C system. Okay? All right, so in any case, we have a difference in mass, whether it's measured in atomic mass unit or in kilogram, whatever it is, and so the question is, where the mass goes? Well, by now we all know that mass and energy are related, and there is a very important equality, which I did touch before. The most famous, I would say the most famous equation in all the physics, the relationship between energy and mass, and this is the speed of light in vacuum. So, 
if we will multiply the amount of mass which is a deficiency between left and right side by square of c square of uh, speed of light we will get the energy which is basically supposed to be released during this process of fission if this mass is greater than this then the excess of mass is something which was which was converted into energy and the amount of energy is this now the calculations show it's a huge amount of energy now in particular if you take one gram one gram of uranium 235 this one and if you assume that all its nuclei are split so that would give you amount of energy which can be released if all the nuclei of one gram of uranium 235 is um, uh, under the process of fission the amount of energy would be equivalent to 5,000 gallon of gasoline. So the amount of energy which, is, which can be released by burning 5,000 gallons of, gaso <coughs> of gasoline is equivalent to amount of energy which can be released if all the nuclei of one gram of uranium is split. Okay, that's huge. And that is the nuclear energy which is the basis for um, nuclear power stations and atomic bomb. Now, what's very important is that the the fission process doesn't really occur always the same way. It's not organized in some way. Um, it's much more complex. First of all, we have to somehow find neutrons to attack the atoms of uranium-235. Uh, so, the more neutrons we are supplying, well, the more atoms become um, excited and split. Now, splitting is also not always such an organized thing. For example, under certain condition it can go into this barium and krypton, kryptonium. Under some other condition it can be something else. For example, I have written here Baron 56 144. It's a different isotope of barium plus kryptonium 36 89 plus three neutrons. So different isotopes of these two elements can be, not necessarily. It can be zirconium 4094 plus tellurium 139 plus three neutrons. Or it can be, I think it's called lutinium or something like this, 50. 7, if I'm not mistaken, plus molybdenum 95, 42, plus 2 neutrons, plus 7 electrons, which means, in this particular case, certain number of neutrons converted, 7 actually, neutrons, were transformed into proton plus electron, electron released, and protons are, are here. So it all depends on conditions, and quite frankly, sometimes it depends just like an accident. Whatever, whatever happens, happens. You never know how it, the atom might actually split. It, it, it depends on so many different conditions. 
that we can just say it's random. In any case, there are different fission reactions based on only one particular thing, how uranium-235 absorbs the neutron and then becomes so agitated that nucle nucle nucleus splits. And in all these cases, there are certain energy released. Now, another element which, exactly, which has exactly the same property is uranium, uh, not uranium, sorry, plutonium-239. So plutonium-239, I think it's 94. I don't remember. I think it's 94 protons. Um, what's important is it actually has exactly the same quality. Absorbed, if it absorbs neutron, it becomes unstable and splits. And it also releases energy, etc., etc. Now, everything is fine so far. And that was until people realized, physicists realized, look, this is two neutrons. This is one. These are three. Now, what happens if just having one particular nu nucleus absorbs one particular neutron, we produce two. These two might actually go to other nuclei which are nor nearby, and the, these nuclei will absorb these uh, two neutrons. Each one of them produces another two or three neutrons, depending on how they split, etc. So we will have a chain reaction. Is it possible? Yes, just possible, obviously. Under what circumstances we will or will not get the chain reaction? Well, let's just think about phys physics of this. You have a neutron which somehow goes into the mass of uranium-235. Now, if it hits the nuclei, nucleus, then nucleus will absorb it and split. But it might not hit a nucleus. Why? Because the atoms are, generally speaking, empty. So the boundaries of the atoms relative to the boundaries of the nuclei are extremely large, which means atom is practically empty. There are some electrons in orbits, and the nuclei, nu nucleus is in the middle of this, and nucleus is very small relative to the size of the atom itself. So neutron can just pass. Now, how to increase the probability of neutron to be absorbed by some nucleus. Well, the more massive this mass of uranium-235 is, the more probability that neutron on its way will hit some nucleus. So obviously the mass is important. And it's not only with the primary neutron, it's also for all subsequent one. Because whenever you have one particular nuclear split, these two electron, uh, neutrons are going into some random direction. So it all goes to all the different directions and again, the more massive amount of uranium we have, or plutonium, doesn't matter, the more massive we have, the more the probability is of chain reaction to start. Because after it starts, after the amount would be sufficient enough to create the mass where the neutron will definitely hit something, that is the mass which might actually start the chain reaction. The amount of mass which is necessary to start the chain reaction is called critical mass. <coughs> now, what's very important in this case is that the critical mass of uranium-235 is about 47 kilograms. The critical mass for plutonium is about 10 kilograms. 
much lighter. Okay, so we need less plutonium. Why? Hmm, it's not such an easy question. It something related to density probably, um, uh, and some other factors. I'm not sure myself, but that's the basically experimental fact. Um, so that's why actually the whole physics of uh, nuclei started with uranium, but then they realized that with plutonium they have better results with a less amount of plutonium. So, that's very important, and um, obviously it depends on not only this particular weight, but it also depends on purity, because you see, uranium-235 or plutonium-239 are not just pure. Uh, in, in nature, we have uranium-238 primarily, and only a tiny fraction of it is 235. So we need somehow to, 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 to separate this. So we don't really necessarily have a pure uranium-235. Um, now, if, for example, instead of this pure 235, we have 20% uranium-235 and the rest, 80%, is uranium-238. Now, in, in, in nature, actually, the percentage is sm much smaller than 1%, but if we are enriching this by basically separating 235 of, from 238, if we have reached the purity of at least 20%, then we need more um, mass of uranium to start critical, to, to start um, uh, chain reaction. So the critical mass of 20% uranium is about 400 kilogram. So we need much more. So that's why uranium, which is basically extracted from Earth, should be enriched, which means the percentage of 235 should be enriched, um, should be greater than whatever it is, and it's the, just a fraction of a percent. Okay, so we talked about critical mass. Now, now we are moving towards two different kind of approaches peaceful and not so peaceful usage of chain reaction. Now, the not so peaceful chain reaction was the first actually. That's the bomb. So if we just don't do anything, just have the critical mass of uranium somehow, and uh, let's say it's a pure uranium or it's a plutonium, whatever it is, we have a sufficient amount, sufficient mass of this, I would say, nuclear fuel, uranium, plutonium, whatever it is. So if we have it and we just somehow hit one of the atoms with the neutron, it can start chain reaction. And if we don't do anything, chain reaction will just go and go and go. Amount of energy released will be huge, as you understand, because I was telling about one gram of uranium releasing as much as 5,000 gallons of gasoline burned. So imagine if we have something like 50 kilograms. So that would be the, the way how atomic bomb actually works. It's uncontrolled chain reaction. All you need is sufficient amount of fuel, which means uranium or plutonium. Sufficient means greater than the critical mass depending on the purity, obviously. And you need somehow to, the first, only one actually, a neutron which starts the chain reaction. So that was uh, the first unfortunate and very, not very peaceful um, application of this particular process. And again, we are using this mass defect the difference in mass between this and this, and Einstein's formula of converting mass into energy. Um, so, 
Einstein was not actually involved in creation of the atomic bomb, um, but he knew all the physicists actually in a uh, so-called Manhattan Project in Los Alamos in the United States of America. <coughs> they came up with the first atomic bomb and uh, he was kind of politically involved. He wrote a letter to President Roosevelt about um, German physicists also going to the same way and if they, if they were the first to um, develop the atomic bomb that would be a completely different story in World War II. So that was a very important letter and that's, that was the beginning of the Manhattan Project the result of which was the first atomic bomb. Um, in the Soviet Union they were doing exactly the same thing uh, plus, they were using a lot of uh, developments which were done in the United States. The spies were working over time, obviously, all this time. So the first atomic bomb was in America, and soon after, the Soviet Union had the same. And, by the way, many um, German physicists, after the war, were cooperating with either United States or the Soviet Union to improve, basically the process of creation of um, nuclear weapon. Now, that's a non-peaceful usage. How about the peaceful usage? Well, the peaceful usage is we have to somehow control these neutrons so they don't really go uncontrollable. So how to do that? Well, very simply, if the mass is significant to create the critical mass, basically, but we will somehow take out the neutrons from the game and what it's basically done is if this is the mass uh, of let's say plutonium or uranium-235 if we will put something like graphite or um, I think uh, borum um, uh, rods inside this body of the uranium, this is uranium, and, and this is a graphite, this is a carbon. This carbon has a uh, property of basically absorbing neutrons without any kind of reaction. So that deletes from these equations the, the neutrons so they do not go further. And by putting these rods down or lifting them up, we can regulate the flow of neutrons. And that's how the nuclear power station is working. So what's important is to, uh, to, to, to check the temperature of the whole process here. And uh, if the temperature is rising above certain limit, we will put the rods down and they will absorb extra neutrons and it will slow down the nuclear uh, fission reaction. So that's how we control it. And obviously the temperature is used to, let's say, heat up the, uh, the steam and it goes to turbines and uh, develops electricity, etc., etc. And by the way, something like 75% of electricity in France is um, produced by atomic stations. Uh, in United States, it's about 20% of electricity is produced by these nuclear um, power stations. And that's what it is, basically. So I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. There are some calculations with mass, etc., more um, detailed than I have just suggested. Plus, there are a couple of nice pictures about how this chain reaction goes. Um, other than that, thanks very much and good luck.